wrestling fans, we have a very exciting announcement. From 4 to 7 p.m. on the Friday when Penn State wrestles Iowa, it's January 28th, we're going to be doing a happy hour at the Vine in Coralville, Iowa. It's walking distance to Carver Hawkeye from 4 to 7 p.m. Open bar, open food, merch giveaway, you name it. It's going to be awesome. We're teaming up with our good friend Stalemates. So Stalemates plus wrestling changed my life. Happy hour at the Vine in Coralville, Iowa, 4 to 7 p.m. before Iowa wrestles Penn State. Be there or be square. Now let's get to the interview. Royce Alger told Lee Weber that he would kiss his feet in the rain on Burlington Street if he caught him in a fireman's carry. And Lee Weber caught him in a fireman's carry, and Royce Alger still has not kissed his feet in the rain on Burlington Street. (laughs) We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it allowed me to focus and channel my energy We're fortunate if you wrestled, because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. If my voice sounds any different, it's because I'm recording this intro on an iPhone. I'm currently out of country on vacation. I'll be back on Sunday. But in the meantime, this is the best we're going to get. Because I'm out of town, we'll only be releasing one episode this week, and it's with the one and only Tom Brands, head coach of the University of Iowa, This interview was recorded as part of the Hawkeye Wrestling Club podcast series. You can watch the video version on the Hawkeye Wrestling Club Inner Circle portal or on the Hawkeye Wrestling Club's Rockfin channel. This interview was recorded back in October, and we covered Tom's early coaching career. We cover some of those 2010, 2009 teams, as well as the current roster. Hope you enjoy it. Fan of the week goes to our good friend Chael Sonnen. You know, people may say, why, why would you give it to someone who's been on the show? But I got to tell you, folks, Chael Sonnen is one of the most avid listeners we have of this show. And I wanted to give him a, a sincere thank you right here on this intro. As always, this podcast is presented by Quant Wrestling. Use the Quant Matchup feature to see who's going to win this Friday's big duel between Penn State and Michigan. Use the discount code WCML to get your first month free. Download the Quant app now in the Apple and Android Play stores. And that's it, folks. Let's give it up for Tom Brands. So you are obviously the head coach of the Hawkeyes here. Your coaching tree starts in 92 in Iowa City, and it goes goes a couple different places. But I heard that it started with a camp you went to with Greg Randall way back in the day. And it was like your first assignment kind of helping him coach a summer camp. What do you remember about that experience? Yeah, and it actually was Gable's camp, but the format that Gable had, it was a training camp, and he would, you know, you'd get 300 kids there, and then you'd have, you know, 12 groups of 25 or whatever it worked out to. And I was Greg Randall's assistant coach for that camp in one of the groups, group three or whatever it was, and um, it was awesome. Something you took pretty serious at the time, was that like your first experience mentoring other kids? It was a natural, that's probably the best word. It was something that, um, you know, Randall was a great mentor because he would say, you know, next year you're going to be running your own camp if you kick ass, that type of thing. And, um, oh, well, this is something I want to do. I don't want to be an assistant again, mm-hmm. so I'm going to kick some butt. 
And I mean, just great m memories of mentorship and carrots dangled in front of you and, um, you know, how Gable ran a hierarchy. You didn't have to be a senior or a graduate to run a group. Um, you had to show that you were uh, serious about the sport of wrestling, you had leadership capabilities and were true to the values of what Gable stood for. And, you know, speaking for Terry, but both of us um, would have jumped on a grenade for him. Mm -hmm. And probably still would. <laughs> um, and that was the truth to that. Yeah. Barry Davis says the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of those guys from that era would. Yeah, I would have jumped on a grenade for Barry Davis and probably still would. It's funny we're talking about Barry Davis because obviously you got the great Spencer Lee. He's a senior starting his last campaign. One of the all-time great college wrestlers for the Hawks, but for you know college wrestling in general. You think about the freshmen coming in now, that's who they're wrestling. When you were a freshman, you were wrestling Randy Lewis, Brad Penrith, Barry Davis. Um, Joe Melchiori. Joe Melchiori, yeah. yeah. I mean, that that's your true freshman year. That's who you were squaring off against quite a bit, right? Yeah. I mean, what is it like for some of these freshmen coming in now wrestling a Lee and DeSanto? I mean... Well, first of all... Um I mean, you don't limit yourself. So you're in the moment. It's not like you're in awe. I mean, you might be in awe for um, a day. Um, I don't remember being in awe except for on my recruiting trip. Um, and that awe went away quick when you saw how human they were. Um, and I'm talking about maybe the first night. And plus, Terry and I were with lifelong friends. Mark Ryland, Mark Chelsvig were on those trips. And um wasn't a big deal after a while. So then you realize that you know, when you aspire to be something, all these awesome wrestlers or whatever people are tools to get you to where you want to go and to duplicate and exceed what they've done. And again, that's the Gable philosophy. And Royce Alger talks about it and describes it as Gable's genius was is that he kept his best guys around the program as long as he could. I mean, you taught, you said some names there, but Lenny Zaleski probably had more influence on me than anybody else at a young age. He was awesome. He was funny. Uh, my relationship, even though he left early, uh, but my relationship continued. He moved to Alaska. He taught Russian up there with his wife. His wife taught Spanish. They had a young family. Terry and I went up there um, to do camps with him. You know, we, we hunted up there. We fished up there. Uh, and Lenny was a, a great mentor and friend. Um, and so it wasn't just... Um, you know, maybe the biggest names, you know, that were on those international teams. Mm -hmm. Every one of those guys you mentioned was a, a silver or better. Penrith, Barry, Lewis, they were silver or better in the worlds of the Olympics. And, um, you know, Luba was a gold medalist in, in L.A. But, um, you know, Lenny was the alternate to Andy Ryan in 84. And um, he probably had the most influence on my career at a young age. And what, what do you Mark mean? Johnson. Mark Johnson, was he's a 198-pounder, and, you know, the stories of him, you know, wrestling 190 and then going down. That Back then, you'd qualify the Big Tens, and then you could go down a weight for the Big Tens of the Nationals. He would wrestle the Big Tens, win the Big Tens at 190, and then for the Nationals, he'd go down to 177 and try to take out Chris Campbell two years in a row. And then he came work here as a grad assistant and was Gable's yeah. right-hand man. Yeah. Big tuna. Yeah. yeah. He's awesome. Quite so he had unbelievable influence. So it's not just the guys that you're wrestling. And then you can't forget Royce Alger. Um, and sometimes I do forget him. And the reason I forget him is because he's such a good friend. Um, but he was someone that... You know, with someone that mentored me, but I, as a true freshman, I was watching him in an Iowa Hawkeye singlet win his second title, and he moved up a weight to to, to make it, make the team better because they brought the Golden Boy Bart Chelsvig, uh, my roommate for four years, um, brought him out of red shirt as a true freshman, and he was on track and then punched the wall and broke his hand. How early so, did he get pulled in that year? Uh, it was before Christmas, if I remember right. I remember a Lehigh duel, if it comes to mind. My memory's not 100%. You know, Terry and I and, you know, Ryland were wrestling open tournaments, you know, and and Chelsea got yanked out of red shirt, so our paths went a little bit different. Mm -hmm. He, um, it's funny you mentioned bringing out a red shirt because one of the stories I wanted to ask you about a little bit later on is when Gable pulled McElravey for the Steiner Shuffle in 93. 
Were you were you around Iowa City when that all went down? Yeah, I was an assistant coach. Do you remember? I mean, I what, remember a lot about that. I remember it was February. I remember that's awful late. I remember late. Lincoln lost his first bout. I remember I walked into the office and um, Gable and Mister McElravey were having a uh, heated <laughs> conversation, and Gable just pointed at the door, and I bowed out. <laughs> and they, I'm sure, finished their discussion in a respectable way to solve the problem. Um, but part of the problem was is that Lincoln, um, you know, I think people give him credit for how tough he was, but I don't know if people know how tough he really was. I mean, he was tough. And, you know, him losing that match wasn't a matter of, or even an indication of what he could do. But that Northwestern guy was not a slouch. That was a real test coming out of Redshirt. And then we had a PA announcer that was, he wore a bulletproof vest, meaning um, he was all about the bravado. Phil Hattie, who's a good friend of Gables and an older friend of mine, but um, retired SID here. Um, but he, first introduction Lincoln had walking out the mat was um, the Dakota Destroyer. <laughs> and so all that's adding up. Tough matchup, first time out of red shirt, all the expectations. Why are we bringing him out of red shirt? To win the national team title. And, um, you know, you're putting Steiner in a place where he's probably not in his best weight class comfort comfortable-wise, even though he ended up wrestling 62 kilo internationally. Um, but if anybody could do it discipline-wise, Troy Steiner could. Yeah. And so all that was going on with Lincoln, and then he lost, and, you know, it was kind of a blow, but... Um, you know, that was not an indication of, there was just a lot piling up on him and then got him straightened out. And then he didn't win a big 10 title that year. You remember that? I don't remember Lost that. Lost to Wisconsin in the finals. Wisconsin Demarai? kid. No. Okay. So. I'm thinking of. Me not remembering shows you who it was. <laughs> yeah. I'm not taking anything away, but, um, and then Lincoln peaked at the right time. Why did Gable pull him in the first place? To win a team title. Three hammers. Is better than two. Mm -hmm. Three out of three at 42, 50, and 50, you know, eight or whatever. Actually, it was my bad. 34, 42, and 50. Got it. You know, Terry was at, Terry Steiner was at 50, McRavey at 42, Steiner at 34. Three hammers at those three weights is better than two hammers at those three weights. And Troy was the national champ coming down. Yeah. He had to come down. Then he wrestled Colat in the semis, right? Yeah. <sighs> Crazy yeah. how it all works out. And that, you know, my favorite part of the story, though, is when Gable, after McRavey lost Northwestern, he brought in a crowd and did mock dual meets in Carver the week the week after, I believe. Yeah, I mean, we had, that wasn't probably the first time, but yeah, yeah. I mean, that wasn't new. I mean, football coach had been doing that since 50s. Sure, true. So if you read up on that stuff, but um, not taking anything away, but yeah. And, and more of it was just getting Lincoln to settle down and be who you are. But Lincoln took care of that. Mm -hmm. Lincoln, Lincoln was, he was in charge of himself. He knew where he was going. Smart guy, driven guy, stubborn guy, like we all are, and makes us our best in a certain way. One of the, just some of the most epic finals matches that I can remember, you know, the Jerry Abbott's match. I, don't, I can't remember how much he was down going into third, but it was quite a bit, and he put the pressure on. And I, that might have been... Carver. Yeah, he was getting... No, that was Ames, Iowa. That was Hilton Coliseum. He was putting pressure on, but he was getting takedowns at the right time, and he was getting takedowns with stall calls. So you're getting three-point takedowns, and, you know, that... In, in, in you know, in McElravey's... Um, the asset that he had for him was a knack to read referees, to read how your opponent was feeling, to read and pick up on the strategy where Abbas was pri probably trying to manage that match down the stretch, and I can give up one here. But he didn't realize the pace was so furious and ferocious. And before you know it, it got to the point where it was too tight. And then bada bada bing, it was, you know, three-point takedown. And then riding time, and then, you know what I mean? I mean, all that. Yeah. Either riding time was erased or riding time was gained or whatever. Pretty amazing, though. Yeah, one of the great, one of the great moments, and then... I don't know if it's a year later or two years later, Gable pulled Joe Williams out in his first match as Pat Smith at Gallagher on senior night at Gallagher. And uh, Pat Smith put it on him pretty good. But it just shows you 
you know, the pulling guys out late in February is uh, is always interesting. It's gone down in the Iowa folklore, I'm sure. Yeah, Joe was seventh that year, and he got, you know, caught in a consolation match that if he wins that bout and he was favored, and I'm not saying taking anything away from that guy, I believe it was Purdue guy, but um, Joe just kind of got bear hugged and fell over, if I remember right, and otherwise he's in the top three to top four, five, or six instead of seventh. Right. And then Gable redshirted him the next year, and that did not sit well with Joe. And so there's another personality story. I mean, Joe was his own guy. He had his own, he was smart. He was driven. He had his own path, just like Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Joe, and Joe it did not sit well with Joe. So I always thought he wanted to sit because he wanted to get his feet back under him after no, taking seventh. No, Joe did not want to sit. Got it. Joe was a competitor from the word go. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome family of wrestling. And then that year, you know, when Joe came out, um, you know, Weber went 42. Oh, Daryl Weber. Right. Daryl yeah. Weber was an All-American at three different weight classes. <laughs> and that year he was at 42. Okay. And that was the days of the overnight weigh-in and there was no certification and he cut a lot of weight, but he did it right. right. Again, a story of discipline. Mm -hmm. And that Weber family, there's nobody better. Daryl Weber and Lee Weber and... yeah. Love those guys. They're out in Virginia, yeah. or one of them's out in Virginia. Daryl's out in Virginia now. Yeah, they're Don Bosco, Iowa. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. It's funny because... Peggy and Pat Weber. Nobody's better than those people. And, <laughs> and um, you know, Lee Weber had the best fireman's carry that this program's ever seen. Wow. He caught everybody and anybody in the fireman's carry. Royce Alger told Lee Weber that he would kiss his feet in the rain on Burlington Street <laughs> if he caught him in a fireman's carry. And Lee Weber caught him in a fireman's carry... And Royce Alger still has not kissed his feet in the rain in Burlington. <laughs> we'll hold him to that if we ever get him on here. Royce Alger would be a great interview on here. Fantastic. We'll, uh, we'll have to do it next time. We're coming back in January for another round of interviews. If you look back at that 93 team when Lincoln po got pulled, Oklahoma State was out that year. So it was really Iowa and Penn State. And people forget, you know, Penn State's obviously great now, but back in the 80s and 90s, heated battles with Iowa and Penn State, and they took a couple dual meets, one of which here in Carver. What do you remember about those Penn State teams from that early Well, era? I remember, I was talking about Chelsvin coming out of Redshirt. Um, one of the, well, the first loss in Carver that uh, Gable had was to Penn State in dual meet 1987-88 season. I don't know if it was in post-New Year or pre-New right. Year. So, right. um, you know, that's interesting. Penn State went into the Big Ten to make it the Big 11, even though it's still called the Big 10. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. Um, there was a close Big 10 race where Gable's quarter century of domination in the, in the big, for winning consecutive Big 10 titles was in jeopardy. And um, uh, there was an issue with um, our number one guy flew the coop, and Kevin Hogan had to step in. Kevin Hogan from Edco. Really? Yeah, he had to step in, and he scored the winning. He scored enough points. We won by four. He scored five. If you want to be that dramatic, that probably would happen. Right. I don't know the facts, but I remember having two guys there, and when one of those guys flew the coop, <laughs> Kevin Hogan stepped in. So in '91, you guys had 11 All Americans, one of which <laughs> not even making the team. Well, we had 10 because I don't know. I mean, not in that, but like on the team, if you look at the whole career of the, everyone on that team, eventually yeah. guys would go on to win. Yeah, we had a poster our senior year. Stryker wasn't in the lineup, and he was on the poster. Wow, that's crazy. Even, uh, you know, I'm looking back at, at your era. You, one of your big breakout matches was at Penn State against Jim Martin, was it? I always get the Martins confused. Jimmy Martin. Jimmy Martin, yeah. What do you remember about coming out yeah, for that I don't one? think that's a breakout match. It was a tie. It was a draw. I don't think he was ready for that kind of pace. Mm -hmm. I think he was ready for a punk freshman that he could bat around. And I mean, it's just, you go out, you do what you do. Yeah. I remember last time we spoke that you and Penrith were working out ahead of time and Gable's like, Brands, if you're going to get the legs in on you, just don't even come. Don't even come. He just basically, yeah. Just I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. I love that. And then that year in a dual meet, you wrestled Kendall Cross. Had you wrestled him before you wrestled him here at Carver? No. How did that one go? It went good, but, you know, the national semis didn't. And I got a freaking email this year. I said, why on earth did you pick neutral in the third period against Kendall Cross? That was this year in 2021. <laughs> that was in 1989. Oh, my God. And I'm laughing when I call him a jab. I don't know who yeah. it was, but 
It's funny. Yeah. And you know what, buddy? You're right. Why did I pick neutral in the third period? Yeah. It was 1-0, and he, I lost 1-0. What happened between 19-9 and 1-0? What, just the mat uh, control? I don't know. What happened? You tell me. I watched the match. You know, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, give a private... Um, it painful. Yeah. It doesn't go away. Right. You know, what happened and what happens in wrestling? Strategies um, happen. Slowing things down happen. Getting caught up in the moment happens. Yeah. Not wrestling your best match. Think guys aren't going to fall over. He started to fall over and I needed a bigger imagination. Mm -hmm. What do you think happened? Yeah. He's no slouch. Just because I beat him 19 to 9 doesn't mean it's going to be automatic the next time. And just because I beat him 19 to 9 doesn't mean that he's a slouch. He was a very dangerous opponent. Yeah, those are it's a epic rivalry that happened that year. And if you look at some of the, we talk about guys coming in out of red shirt. You mentioned striker. One of the guys that I, you know, looking at your staff now, Dan Dennis. When you look at the year, he ended up cracking into the lineup for you guys. Early into that year, Joey Slayton was still the guy. And so you look at some of those battles. Yeah, Joey Slayton was the guy. Joey Slayton was the guy. You know, when Joey Slayton was a runner-up in the Nationals, he was the best. Mm -hmm. and, and Joey Slayton, you know, as his career went on, you know, he had some things outside the wrestling room that he battled. And I don't think he minds me telling you that. I love Joey Slayton as much as anybody. Um, but there's some regret there mm. on his part. Um, he's a great husband and a father to two great kids right now, and he's in the workforce as an electrician. I mean, he's ex highly successful. Yeah. And he had to learn and he, to roll with, the pun roll with the lumps, roll with the punches, because he had to battle through some things. Um, again, because you're the national runner-up doesn't mean that it's going to be automatic next year. And Dennis um, was very serious about wrestling and very dedicated. And the same thing that happened with Terry Steiner and Doug Stryker happened with Dan Dennis and Joey Slayton. The more dedicated guy just sprinted past the guy that was the shoe-in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and now he's on the staff now. If you look at back at that that class that went out east with you and they came back to Iowa, Joey Slayton's there and, and Morning's, well, Morningstar was here, but... You know, what do you take away from your time out east when you were really building a program kind of from you scratch? You don't ever, you don't ever, ever, ever violate your own principles and standards. And I know there's some Hawkeyes that were here that left that have done that. Hmm. And some of them are no longer in coaching. You can never be disloyal to your own standards. And when we went there, and I'm talking we, I'm talking Doug Schwab, Wes Hand. Mm -hmm. When we went there, Lee Fullhart was part of that. Um, we didn't look at us as a program that was going to take five years to get to the top. Here's what we're doing. Here's, how we, here's what we're going to do, but we don't really know how we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. But here's, gonna, here's a loose plan. We're going to recruit the hell out of the country. And we did. And it's still trying to be duplicated other places. Yeah. What was the... Well, I don't really know the journey of how you ended up out there of that particular school. Because you had... Well, I had options to go to Colorado Springs mm -hmm. uh, and work as a resident coach or Kevin Jackson's right-hand man. He was running the show out there as a national freestyle coach at the time. I went out there and interviewed. And um, my time at Iowa was probably done. Mm -hmm. Um it was one of those things, and hey, things happen. And Wes Hand was an assistant out there, and he pushed hard for me when they made a change. And you need somebody on the inside, and I couldn't. I, I mean, I, you and I twice didn't get the job. Nebraska, Oregon, Missouri didn't get interviewed at Missouri. Wow. Iowa, there's six right there that I went after hard to try to get a Division One job, and. You know, didn't get interviewed at Nebraska, didn't get interviewed at Missouri, got interviewed at Oregon. Myself and Zeke Jones both got passed over for Chuck Kearney. Hmm. Then they dropped the program after two years. Um, um, you know, I talked to you and I twice. Yeah. And interviewed there, you know, you know, twice. They hired Manning first time, second time they went with the 
the assistant, Penrith. Penrith, yeah. And Rick Hartzer was AD and so on and so forth. So um, not bitterness there Mm -hmm. um, and not even I should have been the one. It was I wasn't ready and they made the call. And and at the time, it was probably the right decision for for that program. Um, But I also learned that it's not what you think of yourself. And if you can, if, if, if I think I can do the job, it makes no difference to anybody. It doesn't matter. Your self-belief at some point when your fate is in other people's hands, that's why make your hay on the mat as a competitor because you can control it. Mm-hmm. And when you're getting appointed, um, I needed Wes Hand's help. And Jim Weaver was the boss man there, and mm-hmm. he played football for Joe Pa. He played football at Penn State for Joe Paterno. He was an athletic director at um, Virginia Tech. Mm-hmm. And I remember two or three months into the job, I was having a meeting with my senior associate boss, and we were talking, and Weaver stuck his head in the door. He needed something, and um, he interrupted. He oh, sorry, I didn't know you were in here. Coach Benz, how you doing? And he was awesome. We spoke the same language, and... All, I just took that opportunity. We were talking about scholarships, and we were at like five and a half scholarships. I go, hey, Weaver, you think we can get 9.9 scholarships? And he looked at his his other guy, and he looked at me, and he goes, I don't see why we can't turn some <laughs> fat around here. And we had 9.9 scholarships just like that. Wow. And it was going to be painful to try to get it from the from the other guy. Yeah. And that's the kind of relationships that you have when you're loyal and you have enthusiasm and you do not – Dummy down expectations. Just be, just because it's Virginia Tech doesn't mean that you can't do it. Goals are the same no matter if you're at Virginia Tech or Iowa. Yeah, but you got to have the right leadership. Right. Pat <laughs> myself on the back. Yeah. But it tries to get du- – people try to duplicate that, and then they start changing all over the place. Hmm. Changing this, changing that, changing this. And before you know it, you're shooting from the hip. Yeah. What do you think they change? I just keep that to myself. Yeah. If you look at the scholarship thing at Virginia Tech, you you got five, you know, 4.9 scholarships like that. Usually that's a lot of fundraising for someone to get those. And, you know, if you look at what you guys are doing now with this facility, how much is the Hawkeye Club self-funded or Iowa self-funded for this facility? Because it's amazing. There's no, it's all private. That's what I mean. How much have you guys privately raised? Yeah, we're this? over $25 million, so. Unbelievable. It's not unbelievable because it's never been done before, and it's Iowa wrestling. And that's, the, that's what I started with, and that's what I continue to march with, and that's what I'll end with. And our fans and our donors are awesome. Mm-hmm. And there was skepticism, and there was skepticism in this building. And the bottom line was the marching orders were, you raise the money, we'll build the facility. Okay, we're going to raise the money. Wow. I mean, it's not wow. Why are you, why is it incredulous to you? That, that, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. There, it, it shouldn't be, oh, wow. It's freaking Iowa wrestling. And it's ne- we've never asked our fans and our donors. And there was a lot of, lot of energy put into, you know, things that were like on the fly and off the cuff. Um, but you know what? It's genuine. Mm hmm. It's genuine, and then genuine relationships were formed. And I'm, 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 I owe a lot of people a debt of loyalty because it's incredible um, how these people stepped up, these donors, mm-hmm. self sacrifice. So, well, this podcast is for the inner circle members of the Hawkeye Wrestling Club, so the the donors who are recurring on a monthly basis. And one of the questions I got from one of the members in that organization was. When you look at designing the facility, is that something you and Terry design along with your staff, or how does that come about? We are all, first of all, our administration um, knows that we're serious, so they give us a lot of rope. Mm -hmm. Um, When you're designing a facility, phone calls don't do it, and groups of 25 people on a phone call don't do it. It's the relationships with the cross-campus people. Mm -hmm. Rod Leonard's, Adele Van Arsdale. Um, Joe Bellotta, um, um, Can- uh, Bill, Can- um, Bill Cannon, I think it's Bill Cannon. Those are all cross-campus people. The architects, Newman Munson, Tim Schroeder, Bill Hofer, architects. 
uh, fundraising, Kevin Collins, Sloan Tyler, Joe Conklin, fundraising, the University of Iowa Foundation, Fourth Floor Administration, Gary Barda, Barbara Burke, our donors could keep listing them, could go on and on. Yeah. And it's having intimate relationships with each one of those entities instead of facilities downstairs. Damian Simcox, Quentin Garner, those guys are critical to what we do. And having those relationships are critical to what we do. And if, if you try to do this with everybody there, it don't work. And you can't get frustrated. Mm-hmm. And so to answer that question is just be who you are. Yeah. You solve the problem with relationships. Right. Thing is, is, you know, we try to solve a problem in an hour phone call. I put those plans on the back of my desk and I look at them every day. Every time I get up off my desk and walk out and I walk back in and when I walk back into my desk, I'm looking at those plans and I'm not saying that I'm better because of that, but it is a form of discipline when things just, hey, that's not quite adding up, man. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to get, they're, 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 people are trying to ram stuff down your throat. Yeah, this, thing, this isn't going to work. So we're going to be firm, but I don't quite know how to solve it, but I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. So Terry is critical with that. And Bobby Telford and, I mean, Bobby Telford solved our, you know, our recruiting room issue. You know, he said, you got to make it like a suite in Kinnick Stadium, you know, with that, with that seating that goes up and yeah. bingo. <laughs> Bingo, Telfer, that's his, he didn't even have to look at it for 30 seconds. Relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, Terry and I, we, we set that flow. The flow wasn't right between the recovery and the weight room and the locker rooms and the wrestling room. And, you know, they wanted the lounge on the same floor. No, put the lounge upstairs. You know? So you're looking at the natural flow of like a post practice, what you would do. Yeah. Wow. But it's not that easy drawing it. Right. It's not that easy. You think it is, but it's not. You got to have the hallways right. You got to have this right. You got to have that right. Mm-hmm. Got to have the doors in the locker room right. Women's locker room too, right? That's pretty exciting that there's well, women's program, women's right. locker room, and women's locker room's empty. That's not exciting. The women's program is what's exciting, right? And I, I don't know if people realize how big women's wrestling is in the United States right now <laughs> and in the world. Yeah. Um, and how cl- close the United States is, or I shouldn't even say close, because I don't know how close they are to to Japan, but um, how consistent they've been being in that two slot. Mm-hmm. You know, not it's, like they're chomping at the heels, but cu- yeah, a couple of those matches are. You know, Hildebrand and and she has a, a a big rival with Japan, and a lot of those top ladies do. There, I mean, it's amazing to see what we're doing on the national. Consistent, yeah. And that's huge for Steiner. Yeah. And, and, and you know, Steiner has, gets a lot of credit for that. And, you know, Bill Zaddy gets a lot of credit for the men's side. Um, but, you know what, look at the regional training centers for the men. Women regional training centers are just getting going. And wait until they get going. That's where you're going to close the gap. So we might be five or ten years away from Japan if you're an expert and you're a pessimist. Mm-hmm. But the regional training centers take off and the women start raising their own money. For these regional training centers at places. Yeah. Instead of just kind of piggybacking in the men's regional training centers, where there's real opportunities for women to make three, four thousand a month, mm-hmm. like the men. I mean, you're gonna have I mean, you're gonna have your your depth is gonna increase and your top end's gonna go through the roof, just like the men. And what what's happened is, and I think Rich Bender will admit this. Our Hawkeye Wrestling Club and our regional training center, the funding that comes out of here is a subsidy to USA Wrestling. Bill Zadig is a is, he's a manager. The coaches are Mark Perry, mm-hmm. Kale Sanderson, Mark Manning, Brandon Slay out at Penn, who was at USA Wrestling, Terry Brands, who was at USA Wrestling, mm-hmm. Zeke Jones, who's at Arizona State, who was at USA Wrestling. Yeah, you know those are huge subsidies for USA Wrestling, and that's why the man have closed the gap you know they haven't overtaken and they're consistent as well but the women's gap is 40 points yeah the men's gap is there and it's because of those regional training centers fans inner circle you don't think that this is important to this program to the future of this program to the future of these guys careers guys when they graduate but also the mentorship that 
these postgraduates provide in the workout room, if you miss that value and that doesn't make sense to you, take my word for it. It is everything. It is everything. And we do not recruit All-American. We don't recruit the All-American caliber wrestler. Mm -hmm. We recruit the World Olympic and National Champion caliber wrestler. Whether we're asking some of them to walk on, whether we're giving some of them a low amount of money, or we're, we're giving guys a lot of money, we recruit everybody the same. Yep. Because those recruits coming in here are, are wired to win World Olympic and National Championships. They're coming out of clubs in high school that are very serious about the international style of wrestling as well. And, and are trained in a very demanding, serious way as well. So on and so forth. It's cool that the RTCs allow high school kids in there as well who meet at the fourth at state threshold and all of that. Okay, so good. If your voice is going to be on this podcast. Yeah. Okay, so awesome. So great point. But take it a step further. And I'm not the first one to say or think this, but I've heard this and it's, it's absolutely brilliant. It's absolutely true. There's already regional training centers at the youth level. Look, youth level. Yeah. That, that. <laughs> look at strip matter. Yeah. Big time. The guys are consistent from three years old <laughs> to seniors in high school. That's a huge advantage. That's kicking Russia's butt. Yeah. Look at Seabolt. Same thing. Look at Frico. In, in Omaha Council Bluffs area. Look at these clubs all over the country. Yeah. You know, big game. Look at them. I mean, you've got all these clubs all over America. Ivan, uh, Ivan Ivanov. These kids are consistently trained. And then it's the same in college. They go through their, po their, pre or their undergrad. And then they, they're two to five, seven more years right. in the same program. Yeah, it's incredible. And the women aren't there yet. They're getting there. They're getting there. You know, Wyoming Seminary has a great high school program, so on and so forth. They're getting there. Mm -hmm. But you start to fundraise for women's wrestling separately, that's when Terry Steiner will probably become more a manager. Yeah. Iowa Wrestling just announced women, er, women's wrestling is joining the fold. 2025, somewhere in there. One of the biggest announcements in, in maybe wrestling history. How long had that been in the works before you guys were able to announce it, Coach? Uh, this has been pushed by Terry and I to our um, bosses because we know that Title IX a factor. Mm -hmm. And we also know that wrestling can be instantly successful here. Um, that's important. And I'm not downplaying any other sport being added here um, for women's athletics. But do we want to fight for scraps for a decade? Or do we want to be instantly successful and have instant credibility? And wrestling gives you a chance for instant credibility. Mm -hmm. Because of, first of all, Give the women credit. It's huge, and it's only getting bigger. And then second of all, go ahead, piggyback off our tradition. Yeah. Who cares? It's smart people do that. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to see it finally here. We've been talking about it forever. Um, but, I mean, for, for someone to have it first, Iowa, it only makes sense. Well, we're not first. Uh, Sacred Heart and then another Division One school are one and two, and we're the third Division One, but we're the first Power Five. Yeah. And the one that's really, really visible, that has a, a very visible, high-powered, great tradition men's program to add it. Yeah. Not taking anything away from those others. No, not at all. But certainly the Power Five draws more media attention and the you know, Big Ten Network, all of it. It's media huge. attention, Big Ten Network, and young women want to go to school at a Power Five school. Mm -hmm. They want to go to a Big Ten school or Clemson or wherever. Mm -hmm. That's where they want to go to school. Yeah. No, it's 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 gonna be it's gonna change everything. I didn't even think about the RTC part of it because really with women's wrestling now, a lot of it's congregated in Colorado or kind of sporadic. Military. Yeah. And then Sunkiss, it's obviously serious. We we were serious and now we're serious. We have three women here again. Mm-hmm. Um, and there wasn't much interruption, but a little bit. Yeah. But we want to be serious, and we want to be a part of this. And this is a way better way to do it than just having a small women's program in the Hawkeye Wrestling Club. 
The, yeah. Now it's both. No, it's going to be big. You talk about you know big moments for Iowa last weekend, football for a little bit. Iowa Iowa beats Penn State. I know you're a big uh, Kirk Ferentz fan here. For the folks who don't know, could you share to the inner circle members the role Kirk Ferentz played in the Spencer Lee recruiting? Uh, yeah, well, Spencer Lee was here, and um, actually, him and Teasdale were here mm -hmm. uh, on a visit, and it was getting kind of stale. You know, we'd done everything and whatever, and yeah. um, we needed something. And Kirk Ferentz has Pennsylvania roots, and so we called Paul Federici and. Paul Federici said, well, when, when do you want this to happen? And I said, in 45 minutes. <laughs> and that's the kind of guy that Iowa football is. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of guy that Federici is that we have, you know, his ear enough to have him be able to walk into Kirk Ferentz's office and say, hey, wrestling needs a favor. And we burned a favor. Yeah. Because I know how valuable their time is over there. And Ferentz said, bring him over. And we walked Lee and... Um, um, Teasdale. Teasdale over there and we sat down and it was like kind of awkward because Ferentz just started talking and freaking hey me and Terry didn't either <laughs> me, me and Terry looked at each other and got them walked out they talked for an hour in Pennsylvania wow roots yeah it was awesome and Spencer Lee can carry a conversation with anybody and so can Teasdale but Teasdale's a funny guy but, <laughs> um, great great memory and that wasn't the first or the last time they'd done that um, one time we walked um, we walked another lightweight into um, the weight room and Chris Doyle and Brian Ferentz were down in there and it was pretty empty and we walked him in. We go, hey, what just want you? Blah, 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 blah. And freaking Brian Ferentz just looked at everybody and he goes, I don't know why the hell you wouldn't come here. This is lightweight freaking city right here. <laughs> why wouldn't you come to Iowa? That sealed the deal. Yeah. So we've gotten help from them a lot. And, and um, you know, I had an interesting text exchange with Ferris after this Penn State win, um, but basically I said, hey, we piggyback off your environment, stud. You have a great thing going, and you have a great environment, and we piggyback off it with our recruiting. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a hell of an atmosphere to bring a recruit into, and it just shows you how much Iowa people love the University of Iowa, because the fans alone were responsible for, for a couple offsides, I know, just from watching Well, it. I guess there was nine whatever false starts or whatever, but, yeah. you know, you can say what you want about the crowd, and you got to keep the crowd into it. I'll tell you what, when you hammer that opposing quarterback, like, you know, number 31 did, I think it was 31 Campbell or whatever, mm -hmm. That's what wins football games. It's yeah. not crowds keep it going, or you, I should say, it's, but it's our job as performers, as entertainers, as high level elite mentality athletes to keep the crowd engaged with high level performance. Yeah. And don't ever think it's not, you know, the, the, the ravenous crowd comes from inspired performances. So Ironman doing funk and, and getting big points at the right time and big matches, that's what makes those crowds erupt. One that comes to mind for me, Camera Hall 2020, right here in this building. One of the biggest moments that I can remember in Carver history. What comes to mind for that one, Coach? Same as you. Same as you. Yep. Yep. Big one. Now, this year they're coming back. It'll be our first year with fans. You guys are also going to Stillwater for a big one in Texas. When you look ahead to something like that, is that where you treat any different? No, it's not going to be at Gallagher. Is it the same as you? You just as keep talking about where it's going to be, and you talk about your schedule, and you talk about the dates that are highlighted and have asterisks on them and are circled in red. And, yeah. and, and really, they all are because each one, as they come up, is the most important one. But you're... You're talking, you're preparing, you're keeping their their mind on focused on what's important. Yeah. Um, but the important thing is is that um, we perform and that we're ready. And you know what? Injuries are a part of the sport, and if something bad happens, you've got to have next guy ready to go, big dog. Mm -hmm. You've got to be ready to go. And there's a lot more storylines in COVID relief and a high-powered lineup that people think they know who's going to be in there. Don't tell that to our young guys. There's so many more storylines than just Lee, DeSanto, Ironman, Marinelli, Young, Kemmer. Those are the six 
COVID relief guys. Yeah. There's so many more storylines. I love Vince Turk coming back for a fifth year. Vince Turk. Yeah, but what about Shriver? What about Kennedy? What about Ayala? Yeah. You know, what about our young guys, huh? What about those guys? Ibarra, he's maybe underperformed a little bit, but, you know, maybe who knows what will get him going. Mm -hmm. You know, all these guys. Reyna. We we rely on our young guys. It's going to be exciting, especially look at Big Tony Cassiope. Obviously, there's the Twitter world's going crazy. He looks great. He's ready to go. But that's how he's going to perform anyway. Yeah, and I'm like, hey, Cassiope, you don't win enough of this whatever <laughs> fanfare. Let's go win some wrestling matches. And I know he's on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. He's, a, he's, he's, uh, I just love how he performs. And you said it before, like, if you perform, Carver will love you. And a lot of these guys, you know, emb- embody that. Last question for you, coach, as we wind down. If you look at the 2010 squad, you know, a lot of guys on that squad, Dennis Morningstar, still coaching here today versus this squad now. What are some similarities and, and some differences just from what you've noticed with the guys? Um, these guys like the mat a lot. That's a similarity. Um, we've had some high powered classes before that couldn't wait to get out of that wrestling room at the end of the day, and it doesn't work. Mm. Um, and I remember Dan Dennis in particular, he, you couldn't get him off the mat. Um, and these guys loved the mat. Borsho loved the mat. Medcalf loved the mat. Phil Ketty loved the mat. Dan Erickson, um, not so much maybe, but you know, at the end of the day, loved the mat. Um, and, and everybody loving the mat makes it easier to love the mat with everybody else. And so we had a really good um, thing that way. These guys even more so. These guys were were brought up on the mat. And a lot of these guys weren't multi-sport athletes, which <laughs> I like multi-sport athletes, but I also can roll with a, only a single-minded athlete as well. But, you know, like, um, you know, Borshaw, he liked to break now and then, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, Medcalf, he played football. Um, you know, Dan Erickson went rafting in the summer. You know, Phil Ketty likes to bow hunt, you know, and, and Spencer Lee, he likes to wrestle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Warner likes to, you know, he's 21 now. Maybe he likes to drink a cold beer at the appropriate time, but he likes to wrestle. Mm-hmm. Um, Patrick Kennedy, he likes to wrestle. Marinelli, Kemmer, DeSanto, everybody, Caleb Young, they like to wrestle. Mm-hmm. So um, Cassiope likes to wrestle. He didn't play football. So these guys love the mat even more. So that would be a difference. Yeah. So the love of the mat is a similarity, but it's also a difference. Brotherhood there with, with both teams as well? Yeah, but the other team was a little little, little more separated with, with you know, um, some, some, some little bit more clickiness. Maybe that's not a criticism to them. Yeah. Um, this team is together from an accountability point of view that if you're out of line, you're going to hear it from your teammates more. The, 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 the team in 28, 9, and 10 was more, if you screw up, we're going to, ah, I'm going to kind of, it's embarrassing. We're going to kind of let you have a free pass there. I'm not going to get in your business. And it probably hurt some guys. You know, it probably didn't hurt our team result. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it probably hurt some guys where if there was more locker room accountability um, instead of just the coaches handling everything that where when things would unravel, I think, you know, guys wouldn't have maybe the regret maybe they have a little bit right now. I think they would have springboarded into their international careers more because the mat needs to be important. Yeah. And as some of these high powered wrestlers got older and the mat became the hobby and the hobby became the lifestyle it's hard to win, man. It's freaking hard to win. It's hard enough to win. Yeah. And you don't want to... The emphasis isn't on winning with no fun. I mean, it's a blast. Um, but you got to have success. And you got to have success in that room. What about those 91, 92 teams you were a part of? Was it... Tight. Call Tight. somebody out if they weren't on the line? Yes. Throw a heavy loaf of bread at their head. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the, Gable was... I mean, I mean, the, the stories about Gable that where everybody loved him, not true. I loved him. Terry loved him. Barry loved him. Royce loved him. You know, but not everybody loved him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Steiner's loved him, but Steiner's got a great story about Gable where, you know, one of them threw up after a match and Gable said, hey, go clean that up and to the other one. And the other one said, well, that was my brother. And he goes, I don't care. You're twins. 
<laughs> and freaking guy put his head down and went out and cleaned up his brother's puke. <laughs> and that was a note to Terry Steiner. You know what? I better quit being the backup here. Oh, because that was, was the your striker was in. He, yeah. Wow. And I don't know exactly the details, but the way Terry Steiner tells it, you know, that's the gable that could get under your skin mm -hmm. and motivate. Was the Apple story that, that same time? Yeah, but see, I love the Apple story because I thrived on that. Yeah. I don't get interrupted by things from the outside. And, you know, I, re I had tremendous, tremendous respect for my coaches. Mm -hmm. And I remember in an interview, either Terry was quoted as saying it or I was quoted as saying it. Um, we listen to our coaches and we may have a temper and we throw a trash can, but we go off and we're hot headed and the coach is talking. We stop and we listen to the coach and then we throw the trash can. <laughs> right. And there was a lot of truth to that. Yeah. Um, and so the apples were, um, you know, irritating maybe some folks that you might not know their name, maybe. Not jumping on grenades kind of guys, Maybe, right? maybe. Yeah. That doesn't mean that I'm pious or better or whatever. It's just, it's, it's how do you operate in this room? Do you worry about things as insignificant as apples rolling around underneath your feet? Right. Or do you keep wrestling? I mean, Terry, it was a great practice for Terry's world final semi or world championship semi in 93 against the Cuban. Iranians <sighs> were through, throwing cups and paper and... Wow. Up in Canada? Bottles and water bottles and beer bottles, uh, 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 pop bottles. <laughs> Varsity Arena in Toronto, Canada. Hey, Zeus. Jesus Wilson, yeah, go watch the match. Yeah, that's a that's the a Iranians crazy one. were rooting for the Cuban because if the Cuban loses, the Iranians out. Okay. So when Terry started to take that match over down the stretch, Terry was wrestling the Iranian and the Cuban. <laughs> wow, it's uh it's pretty pretty cool to think that you know those you know one more of these gave us throwing the apples. It all comes back somehow. Let's close with a little, you know, a message or like, what, what do you say to the guys looking forward to the season who are part of the inner circle and have been subscribing for months and months, donating to you guys? Keep it going. Recruit. Recruit. Dig deep. Terry Brand said it best. You're, you're in the stands and when we don't perform, you're wondering why we didn't dig deep and get tough. Well, we're asking you to dig deep and get tough. And you know what? We've delivered mm -hmm. in our performance and we're going to try to keep delivering. There's no automatic, but we're going to do our best and we're going to keep delivering, but we need you to dig deep too. And that's okay to talk that way to our donors. Yeah. That's okay to hold them accountable, but we need you, man. So go out and get your neighbor and your fellow Hawkeye. We got 500 Inner Circle members, and we've sold a record over 10,000 season tickets this year. Unheard of. 10, that's in the book. Slam dunk. It's going to be 11,000. And just knowing that the inner circle members get all kinds of inside access, the, the pre-meet, happy hours, all that stuff. But really, it's about giving back to the program. And, and It's about the program. It's about winning World Olympic Championships. It's about, you know, putting guys on that team. But if you're thinking putting guys in the team, then you're thinking too low. Yeah. It's about winning World Olympic Championships. And it's about supporting your Iowa Hawkeyes. It's that simple. Love let, let us do the coaching. Yep. Thank you. How's that? <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Great way to wind it down. Tom Brands, thank you for your awesome. time. Awesome, thanks. Inner Circle. Hey guys, this episode was brought to you by Quant Wrestling. Quant is an app available in the Google and Android Play stores that provides detailed analytics on the sport of wrestling. Use the matchup feature to compare who's going to win this Friday's big duel between Penn State and Michigan. Use the discount code WCML to get your first month free. That's Quant Wrestling, Q-U-A-N-T, available now in the Apple and Google Play stores.